So every do-it-yourself project has its own lingo, and so we're dealing with this idea of you know, prayer is something that you can do yourself. And I consider myself fairly competent uh, to do a lot of things around the house, not everything, at least within certain limits. I, I, I tend to know my limits. But sometimes still when I go to the hardware store, and I'm sure that you've probably had this experience as well, you know, you walk in and you just, you don't know exactly what it is you're looking for, right? You know that you have an idea, and so you start kind of like this. Um, I need one of those things that goes, you know, it's kind of like, right, you do that, until the person finally figures it out and says, oh, you need an escutcheon. I'm like, yeah, because that's a word that I use every day, right? And that's how some people approach prayer, right? There, we create this whole language around it that throws up a lot of barriers to people in terms of their ability to have a feeling like they can be confident and comfortable praying, whether for themselves privately or whether with others. And in some churches, if you notice, and today we're using a little bit of that language because I wanted to give you in the liturgy today some examples of some very traditional kinds of prayers. But in some churches, anytime somebody opens their mouth to pray, it's going to be thee and thy and thou and, and all of those kinds of things. And I don't know if you know anything about the history of those forms and have ever wondered why it is that we still tend to talk that way with God. But uh, it's actually kind of interesting to me as part of a study a little bit in linguistics. Uh, English at one time had two ways to say you as many different languages do. So, for example, when I was taking German, you learn about the idea of there's a do, there's a time when you say do for you, and there's a time when you say see. And um, sometimes you say see, you say see to treat somebody with respect, right? And uh, many languages have that same kind of convention. And the word you was originally just the second person plural. So when you would use it when I was talking to you, all of you. You was y'all, right? That's what it was, right, y'all. And so, uh, the though, the though, yeah, was singular. And so, it was the very familiar form. And it was what you would use when you're talking with people in your family. It was what you'd use the, with the people closest to you. And so, that became the way of addressing God. To speak to God in very familiar terms. And you see that, too, in the sense that Jesus addressed God... We say, our Father who art in heaven. Really, the way that Jesus would have prayed it, he would have prayed something that sounded more like Daddy, Abba, Daddy. And so it also has this very familiar kind of form to it. And so the irony is that as English moved on, we kept thee and thou only in this very kind of formal language that we use with God now. And there are still some churches that, that insist on it, like I said. But don't worry, I'm not, my point here this morning isn't to encourage you to, that you have to understand how to use thee and thy and thou and be able to conjugate verbs and all those kinds of things. It still shows up in our prayers and in our hymns, but uh, mostly I'm willing to leave that stuff to Shakespeare. Because prayer, remember what we said last week, it's about talking to God. It's nothing more, nothing less than talking with God. It needs to be heartfelt. It, it can't be fancy. It, it doesn't need to be put on. But the way that we get better at being able to talk with God sometimes is about listening in on how other people talk with God. And that's why it's important for us to be able to model prayer with our kids. Even if we feel like we're not particularly good at it, just to model the practice of it, whether at mealtime, at bedtime, all those kinds of opportunities that make themselves available uh, throughout the day. But then, you know, how do we as adults, where do our models come from and where do we learn? Even the disciples needed Jesus to teach them and instruct them in this. And so in Luke's gospel, they asked Jesus, teach us to pray. They see Jesus all the time going off by himself and praying. And they say, Lord, teach us. Show us what it is that you do. And interestingly, even though Jesus prays at times all night, he teaches them a prayer that you can learn and say in about 30 seconds, right? And I think that that reflects Jesus' emphasis on simplicity, that he doesn't believe that you need a whole lot of words in order to say something that's really important. 
Think about the Gettysburg Address, right? It's what, 150 words or 100, 180 words, something like that. And it's still one of the most important documents that we have that describes who we are as a nation. So Jesus, in his very short pattern of prayer, only makes seven requests to God. And I'm sure that someday, you know, maybe we'll do a series on that. But for now, let me just hit the high points. Like I said, it's a prayer that we pray in 30 seconds. Most of us only pray it on Sundays. But it has these dimensions that should be able to carry us through the week and teach us a little bit more about how we pray. So the first petition, right? And let's set aside the Our Father who art in heaven. That's more of kind of an introduction that describes who we're addressing. And the idea that we're addressing God, he's teaching them to pray, if you notice, he's teaching them to pray together, Our Father, to think very broadly about who God is, not my God. Sometimes I hear people talk in that way. My God says, I think, what happened to our God? It's our Father who art in heaven. So, hallowed be thy name. It's really calling upon the community to respect God's name. And by extension, the person of God. That was a really important idea in ancient times. The idea of respecting someone's name. I come to you in the name of the king. All of those kinds of things. The name carries authority. And therefore, it's to be respected. So the second one, thy kingdom come. Well, it's based on this Jewish idea. It's an idea that Jesus preached about all the time, probably the single most important topic of his preaching, talking about the kingdom. The simple idea is that when God rules, that things look substantially different than when humans are in charge. When God's in charge, things look substantially different than they do right now. So thy kingdom come. And thy will be done kind of follows very closely right along that. The idea that if God's kingdom is to come, what it requires us to do is to begin to do the things that God would have us do, to carry out God's will in the world. So if we do that, then earth begins to look a whole lot more like heaven than it does right now. The fourth, give us this day our daily bread. Well, that helps us to do two things. It helps us first to trust in God, to provide the things that we need. But then it also encourages us to think only about today. Think about today. Don't be concerned about tomorrow. Think about today. Those are two things that are nearly impossible for humans to do. To trust God for the things that we need and to think only about today. But they're part of the Lord's Prayer because they are that hard. They are that difficult. The fifth, forgive us our trespasses, forgive us our sins, depending on, forgive us our debts, depending on how you grew up uh, praying it, whether you prayed it in a Methodist church or a Baptist church or Presbyterian church. It's a call for us to offer others the same thing that God has offered to us, and that is a clean slate, a fresh start. So it's a constant reminder that if we want to be like God, We have to learn to forgive like God forgives. How about the sixth? Lead us not into temptation. That's a little bit tougher. Lead us not into temptation. Because we don't want to believe that God actually leads us into temptation. There are other places in the Bible where where we rule that out. There's a passage in James, for example. It says, no one should, when they're tempted, should say that I'm being tempted by God. Which seems to directly contradict the words of Jesus himself, right? But I think the way that we could understand this, and this one could definitely get its own sermon, but one way to approach it is to say that we're asking for God in God's power and wisdom to give us the ability to persevere in the face of temptation, to be able to overcome it, to be able to get through it. And then finally, deliver us from evil. And that's the acknowledgement of the prevalence of evil both in the world and in our lives and then God's ultimate power over that evil. Now, you'll note something in Luke's account of the Lord's Prayer, and also in Matthew's, if you read a modern translation of the Bible. If you read the King James, you'll find it there, but if you read a modern translation of the Bible, you'll find that what's missing is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Right? 
You don't get that. You can look in the Bible right now. You can look at Matthew chapter 6. You can look in Luke chapter 11. And you will not find those words. And so what's up with that? Are the Catholics right in leaving it off? Sometimes I will go to a Catholic church and, you know, uh, because I'll go with my wife when we're on vacation and we'll be praying along the Lord's Prayer. I have, and I'm used to praying the Lord's Prayer very loud, right? <laughs> because that's part of my job. And it's kind of embarrassing when you get to the end and everybody else stops and you keep going, right? So you have to be mindful of that when you worship with your friends who are Catholic. Um, the reason why that doesn't appear in the Bible is because later manuscripts that we found don't include it. But at the time when Protestants had this idea in their heads, we ought to give people the Bible to read in their own language. At that time, the oldest manuscripts that people had in their hands to translate from did include that. And so when Protestants started to translate, and started, in, especially in English, to, put, uh, to lay down the foundations of what would eventually become the King James, that was included. And so that's always been part of the way that we pray it as Protestants. Okay? Now, uh, the Catholics do say that phrase too, but they just say it uh, kind of one line later in the Mass. So there's an intervening uh, 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 portion of the Mass, just a couple of, a couple of sentences. So what's my point here in talking about the Lord's Prayer like this? Well, I guess part of my point is we can say a lot to God, and God can say a lot to us in just a very few words. Just a very few words. And if we're talking about the language of prayer and how it can change us and what we need to know about it, it seems to me that this is the most important place to start. Because this true, these ideas are ones that will change us if we let them. Now, if we want to continue to get familiar with the language of prayer, the place to start is in the language of the scriptures. And I took some time this week, actually, to prepare a little handout. And so I'm going to leave this out in the, out in the hallway, out in the narthex. And it's just a little handout. It's called Resources for Prayer. And uh, what have I got on here? We've got uh, passages of scripture where you can see example prayers that others have prayed, you, a couple of basic patterns of prayer, uh, some websites that you can take a look at, uh, a little bit about what are called breath prayers, uh, and then some books that Kathleen and I together have worked on uh, putting together a list. And so I hope that you'll take a look at that. But perhaps the easiest way for us to develop the prayer language, the vocabulary of prayer, is by reading and praying the Psalms. And that's why we're reading the 23rd Psalm today. A lot of times we reserve that for a funeral. But we think about it, and when I read it again this week, it, it occurred to me maybe for the first time that the whole Psalm, we think about it as one that leads us to a place that God's prepared for us kind of when we, when we leave this existence. But another way to read it is God's ability to sustain us in the middle of this existence. It's about God's grace. Especially when I read something like, thou prepares to table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And this is an example of a place where I really like to have the King James. I never ever read it in anything else. Why is that? Well, that's what we're used to. It's familiar, it's comfortable, it's comforting. But it's very much about grace, about the idea that God blesses us even when we're surrounded by people who are against us. And so the Psalms are wonderful for teaching us images that will stick with us. So you think about those images, setting a table, overflowing cups, the valley of the shadow of death, right? These are images that kind of stick with us, ideas. And it's hard to convey sometimes the meaning of the things that we talk about in church without talking in terms of images and pictures. That's how God wired our brains, to think in terms of pictures. That's why we love beauty. If you ask a memory expert, 
to describe, and they have memory competitions, okay? So just like anything else. There are competitions for anything and everything you could ever imagine. But there are these memory competitions that people engage in. They're given random facts, names, you know, numbers, sequences that they have to remember. And the way that experts do this is they actually create what they call a memory palace, okay? And so what that means is you memorize a very familiar space. You start with something that you, that's just there, so your house, for example. And so you mark particular places in your mind as stops as you walk through your house, okay? I'm going to walk in the front door. On the front door, what do I see? And that's where you hang the first thing that you want to remember, on the front door. And when you describe in your mind hanging that thing on the front door, you create this really unique picture or image. That's how our brains work. That's how people remember things. And that's how this language of prayer, this language of the scriptures, these images about who God is and what God does in our lives, that's how they get embedded in us, by using them over and over again. That picture language becomes really, really important. And the Psalms are particularly good for this because they were ancient Israel's prayer book. And there are 150 of them. And they cover every possible range of emotion that you can imagine, from just utter joy to somebody who sounds like they're on the edge. It's hard to say what's going to happen to them next. That without God's intervention, they feel like, I might just lose it here. There are some that are just too real, even for the church. You'll notice, I'm 99% sure. We can take a look now. There are some psalms that are not in the hymnal. And one would be Psalm 137. Okay? And I'll let you look up Psalm 137. You'll be peeking at it at some point during the service, I bet now that I've mentioned it. Oh, it is. Oh, here it is. That's interesting. 853. Open up to page 853. Look at verse 9. Right? This is some pretty harsh stuff, right? We don't use that a lot. Yeah, we don't really use that a lot. My point here is that you can find any and every human emotion in the Psalter that you could ever imagine. It's all there. Love, hate, anger, frustration, joy. It's all there. So if we want to learn to pray it's helpful to have a lot of this kind of stuff rattling around in our brains. Maybe not Psalm 137, verse 8, right? But the things that we find in books of classic kinds of prayers, for example, prayer of St. Francis, the idea that where there is hatred, let me sow love. You can find that one in the hymnal as well. Or maybe John Wesley's covenant prayer. I am no longer my own, but thine. There are these great, great words that if we allow them to work in us, will change us. How many people pray the serenity prayer as a means to, as a means to stay sober? Right? How powerful is that? Give me the courage change the things, to accept the things, to know the difference. I learned early on in my ministry the value of what's called the Book of Common Prayer. So across the street, they're very familiar with the Book of Common Prayer. That's the prayer book that you use in the Episcopal Church, that you use in Anglican churches. Well, before we were Methodist, we were Anglican. John Wesley was an Anglican. So if you go back and you look at our liturgy, the liturgy we use on Holy Days, Ash Wednesday, um, Holy Thursday, other places like that. When I go back, I used to, you know, when I was first starting out in ministry, I was trying to figure out, you know, okay, what are the resources available to me to, to plan a worship service? And 
So I would go back and I would look and I would find that the United Methodist Book of Worship and the Book of Common Prayer were almost exactly the same on certain points. Because that's such, for us as English-speaking people, it's such a rich resource of prayers. You can find prayers for all kinds of things in there. And, and in uh, 1979, when they published the Book of Common Prayer, they uh, gave you the opportunity to have choose from either the old language, the these and the thous, or you could choose from more contemporary language. So you take your pick, which one you prefer. And that's available online as well, and that's part of one of the resources here. So as we wrap this up, what am I trying to get at today? Well, one of the fears that I have, and I hope that you're not walking away with this, but let me just kind of dispel it in any case. I don't want to make it sound as though we're learning a foreign language, because it's not a foreign language. Even though for some I imagine that's how it feels. My point isn't that our own language isn't good enough. Our own language is good enough. It's always good enough. But what I am getting at is the idea that others have something to teach us, that the scriptures have something to teach us, that historical sources have something to teach us. Certainly Jesus has something to teach us about prayer. So here's my challenge to you this week, if you're willing to accept it. I don't know, how many, did some of you accept my challenge from last week to pray for someone? Here's my challenge for this week. In order to experience the Psalms as a prayer book, morning and evening, I want you to do, just open, open to Psalms. Start with Psalm 1. And in the morning, read Psalm 1. Pray the Lord's Prayer two or three times. In the evening, read Psalm 2. Pray the Lord's Prayer two or three times. Do that every day for a week. Keep going through the Psalms so that you can you pretty quickly get into Psalms that express the range of human emotions. Even though you'll, by the end of the first week, you'll only have read you know, 14 but you'll see what I'm talking about. So it should only take you about five minutes, twice a day. So I encourage you to take me up on that offer and take on that challenge because all of us need to develop our own voice for prayer, but when we're trying to get started, it really does not hurt for us to borrow the words of others, at least for a time. Amen?